Well, as a way of reminder, I just want to catch us up on what we've covered over the last several weeks and remind us a bit of the kind of the structure and the, the uniqueness that we have in the book of Malachi. Um, and one of the interesting notes of, of, of Malachi and its structure is how it is written as if it's in a courtroom setting where God is the prosecutor bringing charges against Israel and the different parties within Israel. And this is really interesting because primarily God is speaking in the book of Malachi. And over the last two weeks, we've been focused specifically on the priests who are meant to be the servants, the, the, the conduits of worship for God. They are supposed to be examples of how to honor the Lord. They are supposed to be the gatekeepers of what's acceptable and not acceptable, what is clean and unclean, what is right and not right. They're the ones who guard the knowledge of the oracles, of the covenants, of the law, and share that with the people. Not in a way to lord it over them, but to bless them, to help them, to help them be in right relationship with God. And they were not to be partial, political agents that were seeking their own benefit, but they were there to be servants, to love and care for the church. And what I've appreciated from our time in Malachi so far, um, and, it, and it's really reminded me of our time when we went through it as the men in a study several years ago. And what's been most helpful and what's, what I've been, what's been so clear to my mind is having this right view of God established and reaffirmed in my heart. And I know I'm sure that's been helpful for you. When we were first going through the study with the men, that was, like the, that was maybe the biggest impact. It was like, whoa, God is holy. And I need to treat him with reverence and respect. I need to be careful with my thoughts and my actions because what I do can greatly and has greatly offended our great Lord, our holy Lord. And the approach I should take is not, oh, what about this and what about this? Like we see it so often happening in the questions by Israel. But it should be a humble coming before the Lord, recognizing his glory, his majesty, and seeking to serve him by the way he's called us to in faith. So I've just been, just wanted to share that with you as, and grateful for our time in Malachi. And we're going to continue to see this today. And we'll continue to see this through this book of Malachi. And I know we're going to be blessed. For the better we see God, the more we know God, the more we're blessed by the Lord. <clears throat> well, over the last two weeks, we have finished the, uh, last several weeks, we finished the first and second disputations or the complaints against Israel by God. And this morning, we'll be beginning the third complaint that God brings against the people of Israel. And unfortunately, in this complaint, what we're going to see is the, the, the one-track mind of Israel. Many of you who've known me for quite a while knew that I, I once worked, used to work at a company called ASICS. And Dan, I'm sure you know about ASICS, the running shoe company, all right? And so they support a lot of running events, and they had this shirt that I had that's, that said, One Track Mind. And it reminded me, and it was, it was, like a, it was kind of the, the, the letters were in as if it was a, um, a, a racetrack at a high school, you know? And it reminded me of, um, uh, of our time here, because this is what we're going to talk about. The complaint that's going to be brought against the people of Israel is a complaint that we have seen over and over and over again. And it seemed as if Israel just stays on this one track. And although the Lord is so clear, he sends so many of his servants to help them. He gives them so many blessings in, 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 in his law. Still, we find that they fall into this track and fall into this circle, into this loop of, um, of idolatry in their covenant faithfulness to one another. So, um, as we typically like to do, we'll start off... Our, our time this morning with the question, the framing question. So for this morning, our framing question is, what are we to learn about honoring God from this third complaint made against Israel? What are we to learn about honoring the Lord, about honoring God from this complaint against Israel? And if you're taking notes, this brings us to our first point for this morning. God calls his people to faithful covenant purity. God calls his people to faithful covenant covenant purity. Now, unfortunately, a, a consistent and major concern of God with the Old Testament, especially if you're reading the, 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 the prophets and the minor prophets, but it's, it's all over the Old Testament, is the faithfulness and purity of his people. And the fact that he even has a people is contingent upon one thing, and that's the fact that he's actually established a covenant with those people. 
And that covenant regulates and dictates the relationship between them. It sets up the, the, the rules and regulations. And we started to talk about this a little bit in our uh, Sunday school this morning, and I'm excited because we're, the hope and plan is for us to actually develop uh, a course at some point for us to talk about covenant theology, have, for us to have a better understanding of what does it look like for humans to have a relationship with God and how God is the first mover in that. He is the one that establishes relationship with us, and he does that through covenant. And God has been concerned in a lot of the Old Testament for the faithfulness that we would honor the covenant he set up with us. Because in in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they had duties, they had things that they had to meet, that they had to uphold. And that is kind of what what regulated their relationship. So we're going to see this again addressed in this third complaint, the covenant, their, their faithfulness and the purity of that. Let's let's begin in chapter, I'm sorry, in uh, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Let's jump into verse 10. We have here in, in, in God's courtroom, the, and he's, the, the prosecutor, as he's laying out and beginning his argument, he's beginning with a, a line of questioning, a, a rhetorical line of questioning. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? In this line of questioning, the prosecutor is, is appealing to creation, to the thing that binds all humans, that none of us created ourselves, and that we were all created and indebted to God. So then why are we acting so faithlessly to one another and profaning the covenant of our fathers? This reality, this, uh, this appeal he's making, it's what we're supposed to see how how it's beyond reason, it's irrational. It's, it, it's, it's not com- it, it goes beyond common sense that we would choose to act in this way, that we would be unfaithful to the covenant. Do we not realize that we are created creatures? Do we not realize that we are brothers and sisters through this wonderful blessing of a gift that is the covenant to the people of Israel? That's what we're supposed to hear here. Why do we trample and abuse the honor of a covenant with the Creator? Why does this happen? Why, why is this the case for the people of Israel? And the answer is clear from the rest of this passage. It's, it's sin. It's the fallen nature of humans. It's, it's the great problem that we have, that we sin against a holy God, that we sin against his good things. Let's pick up in verse 11. Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For what has Judah done? Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. So here the indictment, the charge has been laid out completely before the people, specifically before the the men of Israel. And the heart of the matter is this, that Judah has been faithless. They have been charged as unfaithful. And this, unfortunately, is not the first time we've heard this. And Israel has profaned what is holy and loved by God. He has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord. To profane is to, is to defile, is to make unclean, is to pollute. That's, that's the word I feel really highlights this correctly because God is pure light. God is pure in his, in, in his being. And our sin is stain. It is pollution to his holiness. And so here Israel has polluted the sanctuary of the Lord. And the sanctuary of the Lord, yes, it's it's his temple, but it's also his gathered people where where he is and where he places his name, where his love abides in his people. So Israel has polluted this sanctuary. And what is this faithless abomination that has been committed? It is the marrying of the daughters of a foreign god. The marrying of daughters of a foreign god. And this is that this is that one track. One track I was referring to earlier. This has been a a constant issue and problem for the people of Israel. And God has gravely and in very clear terms warned them about these practices. And they have yet to heed the warnings. 
At this point, the people have been returned out of exile, for which they were taken out because of their lack of faithfulness. The temple has been rebuilt, and still one generation, one and a half generations later, we fall back into the same sin that has plagued them in their history. They have not taken the heeds of the specific scriptures and oracles, nor of, of the examples in history that have been given to them. Solomon being the perfect example. He was the wisest. The, the, peak, of the, the peak, the pinnacle of, their, of the, the golden age of Israel was led by Solomon. And what took him down? It wasn't armies. It was his unfaithfulness to the Lord through marriage covenants with foreign entities, with foreign gods. Deuteronomy 7 spells this out so clearly for the people of Israel. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Why? For they would turn away your sons from following me, from following God, to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. And so what we see here in this charge is, is, is twofold. It's twofold. Yes, God is bringing his charge against the men of Israel who have chosen to pursue wives, but also against the fathers who have chosen to seek wives for their sons from other nations. And God has clearly prohibited this. His rebuke for them, although it was clear in Deuteronomy 7, is also clear in verse 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is the strongest rebuke possible that God can give to the people. I will completely cut you off, cut you off from my presence. And uh, obviously the tense here refers back to when the people of Israel were a nomadic tribe going through the land of Israel. And, and to be cut off from the tents was to be put outside the camp. And being put outside the camp was a death, was basically death. It says we no longer identify you and you no longer have access to God, to worship with his people, to be amongst the, the, the blessing of, of the teaching and the blessing we receive as a nation. It's a grave and strong rebuke. It is excommunication from the presence of God. So here we have a clear call in, the, in these first verses that God is calling his people again, so graciously again, to faithful covenant purity. Faithful covenant purity. At this point, I have a question for us. As we consider Malachi, as we consider the, the in, indictments brought against the, the, the people of God by, by God in, in his courtroom setting, question for us, as we think about the covenant and being faithful, are you committed to faithful covenant keeping? Are you committed to faithful covenant keeping? Often we might, we might fall into maybe the understanding that covenants was just for the Old Testament. You know, that, that's, that was a significant thing there, but covenants are not just for the Old Testament. Covenants continue today. They're, and they're extremely important to God. Covenants today can be in the form of vows. The, 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 obviously, the one highlighted here in our passage is the marriage vow. That is a covenant. It can be an oath. You're sworn into office. We just talked about the president. He takes an oath when he's sworn into office, and he is promising. It's unfortunate to see that so many people do commit oaths these days, blasphemy, by putting their hands on all sorts of other weird texts and blasphemous texts and not on the Bible as it used to be. Put your hand on the Bible before the Lord. I swear, I uphold, I will do my duty as, because people recognize that they were servants of the king. Contracts, those are our commitments and promises we are, we are choosing to make, whether it's a payment on our end for duties received, or vice versa. But also, it doesn't have to be something so formal as that. We have, we have covenants and our obligations and duties. Our obligation as a, as a son to my father, as a father to, to my daughter. Those are also covenants we are held to. And we have duties to one another as church members. So covenants are still very much a part of our day to day. So are we seeking to faithfully keep those covenants as best as we can? We all have covenants to our families, our siblings. Are we seeking to be as faithful as we can to those whom the Lord has providentially put into our lives? I didn't pick my dad. You didn't pick your brother. You didn't pick your sister. But in that, God is calling us to a faithful witness in that covenant relationship. Some areas you might have chosen those, you might have chosen your neighbors where you, where you live. 
The, whole, the, the second table of the law is summed up in what? Love your neighbor. That's a, that's a call for us. It's a covenant for us to love those whom God has put in our path and how to do it with the law. For those of us who, not just in our kind of immediate settings, but also in work, in our place of business, some of, some of I know you are our business owners. That is very much a covenant, a commitment. You're promising to do certain things for your clients. You're promising to give and provide certain benefits for your employees. And it's significant. And what you do and how you do matter significantly. In all of these areas with our families, with our neighbors, in our businesses, God is watching us. We are making these promises and covenants before the Lord. And our faithfulness to those promises, our faithful to those covenants, reflects our understanding and our faithfulness of God to us. And so Christians should exhibit a godly dedication and commitment to fulfill whatever we covenant to. And why do we do that? Is that because it is a good thing to do? More than that. It is because God has first been faithful to us. He has first been faithful to, to fulfill his promise to send us Christ, his promise to bless us. That is why we then, in turn, should seek to have the same godly dedication in our lives and our areas. So this, this first category I highlight here is more physical, relational things here, but we have spiritual covenants as well. Our first and, our, our first and greatest covenant is we, we are covenanted to Christ in this new covenant. Praise the Lord for the new covenant, that we don't, we're not under the Old Testament covenant and the, and, and the legal demands, the, 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 the burden that was on the people. But today, in, this church, in, in our day and age, we experience a new covenant in Christ. And when we get baptized, the name of Christ is, is placed on us and we publicly declare before the church that I love Christ. And we are not our own anymore. We've been bought with the price. Well, that is a covenant that, God, that Christ expects us to seek to live out faithfully. Are we seeking to do that? Are we seeking to honor the, our God and King, our rock, as faithfully as we can in faith? Another, another, the second spiritual category is, obviously, when, when we come and place our faith in Christ, we join the body of Christ, and that is the church gathered here. And it, it's helpful that in this season, we've been talking a lot about church membership. We have our church membership class. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. And, and again, we, we, we see this category of covenant, covenant coming up, and, and rightfully so, we can address it in church membership. And church membership is a covenant to one another. That's what we're doing. And we promise four major things when we choose per church membership here at Disciple. We promise as Christians to one another to trust and obey the word of God, first and foremost, above all things. We promise to promote and protect the unity of this church, seeking to love one another in that way. We promise to take part of the edification of the church. And lastly, to be faithful kingdom witnesses of the church. <clears throat> well, I want to take some time while we're in this section here to address another matter, another thing mean, that's helpful for us to highlight as we look at our verses this morning. We looked at two areas of the covenant, but there's a third, there's a third category that is helpful for us to discuss, and that's God's design for relationships. Are we committed to God's design for relationships? The problem here is that Judah was faithless because they pursued marriage outside the covenant community. They pursued marriage outside the covenant. They decided to go against God's design. They decided to go against God's blessing. And 1 Corinthians 7 is so clear in the New Testament. We, that we are to marry, we are to pursue these relationships, but only in the Lord. Amen. And so for those of us who, who are here, who, who aren't married, who have either never been married, or maybe they're widowed, or, or unfortunately divorced, I want to encourage you, brothers, sisters, do not let your spirit rationalize yourself into a sinful marriage with someone who doesn't share faith in Christ. It is not okay. It is not his design. It, is, it does not receive his blessing. Brothers and sisters, trust yourself. Trust yourself to God's sovereign providence in your life and commit yourself to those he does have in your life at this moment and align yourselves with, with those who he, he does seek to bless you with. Live by his design and precepts. May we heed the warning here, the example given to us by the uh, Israelite people. 
Well, our first main point for this morning was that God calls his people to faithful covenant purity. And we, and we see that, yes, those, there's a specific covenant being addressed here, the Mosaic, Mosaic covenant, people of Israel. But obviously today we have many covenants that we can be uh, co- uh, faithful to. Our second point for this morning is God disregards the false worship of unfaithful hypocrites. God disregards the false worship of unfaithful hypocrites. God is not pulling any punches here in the book of Malachi, as we've already seen in chapter 2 and will continue to see throughout this book. But God is very clear about he treats, how he treats hypocrites and people who assume that they can just do whatever they want with, with the Lord. And the, the sacrifices of those whose, whose hearts are not fully for God have always been disregarded. They have always been disregarded. They have never seen as true worship. This morning, we talked about, again, several things that are in my sermon we're talking about this morning, which is great. So I'm just going to keep pointing back to that. But this morning, who did, who did we talk about? Cain and Abel, right? And his, his, his worship was not regarded. He did not receive the favor, right? And his, it's clear his heart was not for God. Right? And what did we see as the result of that? He then goes and kills his brother. So that's, that's very early, chapter 4. And we see that over and over and over again. The, 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 the sacrifices of those who have not been after God have always been disregarded. What happened with King Saul? He didn't wait for Samuel. What happened? He loses the kingdom because of that. That one action of, of, of doing the sacrifice himself and, and not obeying the Lord is the reason why the, the, his, his position was taken away from him. Hypocrites who are unfaithful to the covenant and pursue their own interests, they are their own gods. They are not seeking to live humbly before God. They want their own thing. They want to do their own thing. And so hypocrites who, who, who act in this way, who, who, who have this heart, whatever external acts they might have, whatever emotions they might show, at the end of the day, amount to nothing more than false worship. True worship comes from a heart that desires what God desires and obeys what God commands through faith in Christ. Amen? Let's continue on in our verse. Verse 13, for our second main point. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one? with a portion of their spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. I've appreciated, ever since we went through our studies together as men, this specific passage in calling, the the insight, God is seeking godly offspring. And part of why I appreciate it, it just brings a smile to my face, that God desires that we would be building families and growing families and making disciples through the, through the means of marriage that gives us in procreation. And, um, you know, I had a conversation with my sister about this. And I said, hey, don't push off marriage so far. God wants godly offspring. Pursue marriage. It's a good thing for you. It's a blessing for you. And, she, and I, so I, I brought her to this verse, and she was so surprised to see that. And I was blessed to be able to share that with her. Let's continue on verse 13. Sorry, back to, our, back to our main point. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. So back in the courtroom, this is the second point of this, this third complaint, this third disputation against Israel. And the prosecutor, God, in his, his court, he's calling out the hypocrisy of Israel. Because what were they doing? They were going about marrying who they desired, pursuing their own lusts, and at the same time, were then coming into the sanctuary and offering sacrifices. And when those sacrifices were not given favor, were not regarded by the Lord, they were weeping and crying and showing all this emotional hubala over that fact. They thought that I can, just, I can just have whatever lifestyle I want and then still do externally what I know is good to do in offering sacrifices. And so they covered the Lord's altar with tears and weeping and groaning all because of their sacrifices not being, disregard, being regarded. 
And interesting for us to note here that although we see the Israelites coming with much emotion and weeping, it looks very genuine. It seems as if they're sorrowful about what's happening. But we, 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 we need to see that our emotionalism, just because we're so excited or we react in a, in a certain way with, with many tears, that doesn't move God. That doesn't change God's mind. That doesn't change God's law. Deuteronomy 7 is still Deuteronomy 7, no matter how much you weep about it. And we see this in, verse, in, in chapter 3, ver, uh, verse 6. I'll just read it real quick. For I, the Lord, do not change. God doesn't change because we want him to change, because we think he can change. He doesn't change. So our emotionalism, our, our, our weeping and wailing is never going to move God away from what he has already decreed. <clears throat> the people had clearly come to this understanding. They had clearly come to this place where they com compartmentalized their view, their faith and practice. They didn't see it like God sees it, where it's one and one, one, one in, one in the other together. They thought, okay, I can have my personal life over here, and I can have my church life on Sunday. Oh, Saturday for them, <laughs> right? But that's not how God sees it. God clearly sees through their false worship because of what they have done with their greatest vows, their marriage vows before the Lord. Verse 14, we see the response from Israel. But you say, why does he not? Another offensive, whiny question from Israel regarding their charge. Why doesn't he regard our favor as if it's not clear? as if they were, there's some mysterious reason as to why God no longer regards their favor. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. When you took that marriage vow before, uh, before your family, I was also there. God has a role in every single marriage, and he is witness before those vows, and especially, especially blesses those who are in the covenant community. And what, what has Israel done? They have disregarded it as if they can do whatever they want with that vow, as if God was not there watching and blessing that. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So why did God disregard their acts, their sacrifices? Because of their blatant acts of unfaithfulness toward their spouses. And this act of faithfulness is we see in verse, in verse 16, if we just go a couple of verses down. Um, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. The men of Israel were divorcing their wives to pursue marrying the daughters of foreign gods. So not only were they participating in, in marrying these things, they were also divorcing those whom they were, who they had vowed to protect and care for the daughters and sisters of their people. Proverbs 18.22 says this, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Same could be said about husbands, right? Who finds a good husband finds a good thing, right? So our spouses are given to us by God. There are blessings to us by God. And, and in verse 14, God calls them our companions by covenant. That vow that we make in, when we get married is that covenant that we, are, that we are taking before God to care and to love in sickness and in health, in rich and poor for our spouses. So when Judah is being faithless, when the men of, when the men of Judah are, are disregarding the wives of their youth, they are breaking the covenant at every level. They're breaking their covenant against their neighbors, against their sisters, they're, they're breaking the covenant against God, the one that they, took, they vowed before him. And this disregard for the marriage covenant, this is why God says, why would I regard your offering? I'm going to disregard you. I'm going to disregard your false worship for what they rightly are. Not only were they being faithless, the people of Israel, and falling short of the demands of their covenants, of their vows, their actions in divorcing the wives of the youth were going against the purposes and design of marriage that God has. Let's read on in verse 15. Did he not make them one, he being God, with a portion of their spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? 
godly offspring. The actions of Israel in allowing this for the fathers, the priests to allow these idolatrous marriages thwarted the posterity of promise. Again, we talked about this in our Sunday school this morning. But there's a significant theme. There's a significant promise. They are waiting. They are waiting for the seed to come. And this starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is God cursing the snake after the fall. Um, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This seed, that was this, was this one to come, this was, for, for that to happen, we needed to have continual covenant pure marriages through the people of God. We see this, this is revealed more for us as we continue in Genesis. Genesis 22, verses 16 through 18. God's now speaking to Abraham. And by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, this is what God had called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Earlier in Genesis Abraham had already believed that God would bless him like the stars in the sky. And here we see more and more the the promises unveiled to us. So their unfaithfulness in choosing to to marry the daughters of foreign gods, it was working directly in opposition to this promise that God would one day bless the world through the offspring of Abraham. The hypocrites clearly showed no care, no desire for the things of God, only what served them and their lust and their desires. Another question for us as we consider this. Is your most intimate covenant rightly ordered and prioritized? Is your most intimate covenant rightly ordered and prioritized? The most intimate covenant humans can have outside of of, of a covenant relationship with Christ is marriage. And in marriage, as we've seen already, we are made into one flesh by the Spirit. This is by far our greatest and earthly relationship. It's greater than the relationship I have with my daughter, the relationship I have with my wife. And as we talked about again this morning, the, this has been from the beginning in Genesis 2. And Paul in Ephesians tells us that this is speaking about uh, Christ and his church. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. God cares significantly about how faithful and committed we are to one another, and in specifically the covenant of marriage. And when we trample and abuse this covenant, we trample the mystery that it is meant to reveal to us. The covenant of marriage is a reminder to us each and every day of the beauty and the mystery of Christ and his coming to save his people, to be one with them. And we're saying that we, we, we don't care that God chooses to covenant with us when we disregard marriage, when we disregard our covenants. We don't care that God is, he says, I'm a faithful Lord, I'm a faithful God, and I will bless you, and I will be with you, and my relationship with you will be a loving one and a sacrificial one. We trample on that when we choose to disregard the marriage covenant. So brothers and sisters, let us remain committed and faithful to our most intimate covenants. Make sure we are rightly prioritizing and investing and supporting and seeking to bless them, to honor the Lord through them um, as those covenants reflect not just our lives, but reflect true realities about the church and Christ. A second aim is given to us here for marriage, and that is godly offspring. In our, in our covenants, we are supposed to be working and making disciples through marriage. To, to be able to pass along the traditions, the gospel, with one whom the Lord has given us. Let us rightly prioritize that in our lives. Let us encourage that in others as we see it in them, as we, as we talk with them. In this day and age, many people are choosing just their own interests, their own time, their own travel, their own whatever X before what the purposes of God has given for marriage. And so let us encourage one another and encourage those in your lives to say, hey, God has good things for this covenant of marriage and it is godly 
offspring pursue that. Now, for those of us who are not married, um, who are not in the stage of, of, of rearing children anymore, there's, there's still many intimate covenant relationships that you can prioritize and make sure are rightly ordered. You still have deep, intimate relationships with your family members. You still have deep, intimate relationships with members here at this church that God is holding you responsible for and God wants you to be faithful to. And so I, I want to encourage you to, to, find, to find new ways and, and, and new opportunities to commit yourself further to those relationships, to strengthen and deepen those relationships, to bless those relationships. And if, if you're here and, and you don't feel you really have some of those kind of deep, intimate, intimate relationships, well, let this be an encouragement to seek those out. Don't just stay in that position. Seek that out. And the best place for you to do that is here at the church. Pursue one another. You don't have to be friends with everybody. That's not what we're trying to, what we're trying to say. But you can have deep, intimate relationships where you show the love of Christ to your brother, to your sister, by seeking to be the best godly friend you can be to them. You can do that today. All right, our final point for this morning as we're wrapping up. Our first point was God causes people to faithful covenant purity. Our second point was that God disregards the, the false worship of unfaithful hypocrites. And our last point is that God calls his people to guard their spirit for covenant faithfulness. God calls his people to guard their spirit for covenant faithfulness. God exhorts his people to guard against that which will draw them away from pursuing covenant faithfulness. The scriptures are clear that we are to keep our hearts with all vigilance against committing acts of unfaithfulness that first and always transpire first in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts. Let's continue reading on. Second half of 15. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. In this last section here of the, of the third disputation, we have this, this, this repeated exhortation to guard yourselves in your spirit and to not be faithless. And this highlights first and foremost the, the root, the nexus of unfaithful practice. It doesn't start first in what we do externally. It always starts in small, secret places. As my brother likes to say, the erosion has slowly and, and, and secretly in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, with our thoughts. And so God is, is being clear and, and doubly reminding us that we are to, to guard our spirits. We are to work and to persevere in seeking to protect our hearts. And in doing that, in guarding our spirits, we need to be willing. We need to be willing to punch intrusive thoughts in the face, to not accept them. We need to be quick to confess those things that come up to our brothers and sisters, to bring things into the light. And lastly, we need to invest our time to build up intimacy and connection that helps fight against potential uh, discontentment, potential uh, lack of appreciation, whatever it might be, whatever thing is developing in your mind uh, that might take you away from these things. Because the, the, the consequences are serious for those when we, when we lack self-control in our spirit, when we allow ourselves to entertain those thoughts, as we see in verse 16. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, the one who commits these acts of unfaithfulness, he says to the Lord, the God, the, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers, covers his garment with violence. It's a, it's a very vivid image of what is happening when we seek, when we break those relationships, when we break those covenants through lack of self-control, through sin. It brings the wrath of God against us. It brings the consequences of his judgment against us. And that is vividly portrayed in there's, there's blood on our garments. There's blood on our hands. When we take our own lusts and prioritize them and pursue them to the detriment and to, to the dis destruction of our, 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 our marriage vows or our relationships with our families or, or our friends and our close loved ones, we're, we're doing violence against them. There are real consequences of that. So, so God reminds us to guard ourselves, to be aware, to be considerate of what that is and the consequences of it. Well, last question for us this morning is, as we wrap up, we're hearing a lot from the book of Malachi 
and uh, sometimes it can be really hard to hear. But thankfully, we are not without someone who can help us in all of this. Amen? Last question for us. Are you clinging to Jesus Christ and his word to guard your spirit? Are you clinging to Jesus Christ and his word to guard your spirit? Thankfully, the Lord does not leave us without proper equipping to guard us and to shield our spirits against this temptation to be unfaithful. He teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He gives us his word and his scriptures to remind us of his promises and of his return. He gives us his spirit to lead and guide us, to help us to fight against temptation. He shows us in his own example of how to fight in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his very often, he would, he would go away from the crowds and he would seek to be with the Father. After spending hours healing people, sometimes who weren't even grateful, sometimes who only wanted the bread that he produced, he would go to be with the Father to protect his spirit. Excuse me. We see in his example and how he fought the devil in the desert with the scripture. And the, the, was there a greater temptation that the devil could give anyone? That all the nations of the earth will be yours? And he righteously, rightly, appropriately responded to the devil, be gone. He leaves us with a true hope through his death and resurrection that we can have an abundantly renewed life through him. So are you clinging to Jesus Christ and his word to guard your spirit? It's a high call for us to this faithful covenant living. And thankfully, Jesus perfectly obeyed this. He was the one who fulfilled all of the Old Testament regulations, all of the stipulations of the Old Testament covenant. And because of him, we now can enter into the new covenant. And we can participate in wonderful union and relationship with him. So let us be reminded of this as we wrap our time this morning. He is so faithful to us. So let us in turn seek to be as faithful as we can to him, to honor and glorify him in all of our beings, especially in all of our relationships and all of the opportunities that the Lord gives us. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that you first and foremost are a covenant-keeping God. And you fulfilled your promise of the godly seed, the one who would come to crush the skull. You sent him and he lived a perfect life, a perfect life we could never live, a perfect life that millions have tried to live but have fallen short. Great kings fallen short. Generals fallen short. Priests have fallen short, but not your son Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder for us to be, to pursue faithful covenant purity with you. And we thank you, Lord, that you have secured and even allowed us to do that through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we embark on our week this next week, may we be reminded of the great blessing and covenant we have in you through Jesus. And that through it, we are enabled to love and to care and to sacrifice and to give much to those whom you have brought along our path. Help us to be faithful, strong husbands in our marriages. Help us to be faithful, strong wives in our marriages. Help us to be strengthful, uh, strong brothers and sisters, mothers and, 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 and fathers to those whom you have put into our lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the rich blessing that it is to worship alongside. Lord, thank you that you have created us and you have made us one in spirit through Jesus Christ. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.